Hi, everybody. Jennifer Schaus here coming to you live from Washington, D.C. And thanks for joining us in our monthly series, which is the Government Contracting Q&A Cafe. Uh, this is a webinar series. Uh, it's going to run for about an hour and a half, and we're going to take live questions uh, from the audience to our experts. And today we're covering oral presentations. Um, if you have registered and paid for the webinar, you can get to the recording using the same link that you use to register. Uh, we post all of our PowerPoints for all 450 plus of our webinars on slideshare.net. It's a free site, and I believe you can log into Slideshare using your LinkedIn account to skip a couple steps. Uh, this is just a history of what we covered earlier this year. So if you missed any of these and wanna purchase the webinar, you certainly can. Uh, January, we started off with a hot topic of CMMC that uh, we dug into OTAs and other um, government contracting topics that you can see here. Uh, July was proposal writing, last month was compliance, and here we are, September oral presentations. The next three months uh, should be exciting as well with set-asides, pricing, and closing out the year with mergers and acquisitions. Again, these are the second uh, Friday of every month, and they run from 12 until 1.30. So just who we've got uh, coming up next month, um, Anna, Eric, Sai, and Tim are covering set-asides, uh, Marsha, Tracy, Mike, and Jeff are covering pricing, and then our mergers and acquisitions will be covered by Shirley, Josh, Kate, and Brad. Um, as an FYI, uh, we are hosting a webinar it's going to run about two hours. It's uh, best practices from various uh, industry leaders, and I'll call them government contracting uh, influencers that uh, you guys probably know very well. That's October 1st at 12 o'clock. Uh, the sessions here are listed. We're going to cover best practices on market research, marketing, sales, proposal writing, and compliance. I believe that we now have uh, 300 people registered for that event. Uh -huh. Uh, so if you want to sponsor, you're welcome to. If you want to attend, it's complimentary to attend. Uh, more information is on our website under the events. This is a virtual event, um, so it is not in person. Maybe next year. Uh, a little bit about our services, uh, consulting services for federal contractors. We work with both product, service, and uh, software companies. Uh, more information on our website. And today's sponsors, we want to thank our friends over at the Virginia PTAC, the Procurement Technical Assistance Center. They're a great resource uh, across the country for anyone, uh, any burgeoning businesses or startups that need one-on-one -on -one venturing, counseling. They've got a lot of great training sessions, uh, as well as some matchmaking events. I teach a couple classes there on GSA schedules. Um, but if you click on their, uh, any of their links, you can get to their training calendar or sign up for a one-on-one -on -one counseling session. So thanks to the Virginia PTAC, housed over at the George Mason University for their sponsorship. We also want to thank our friends over at Crown Castle. They're an IT provider. They sell to both the government as well as government contractors providing IT and network services. If you're trying to get in touch with them, your point of contact is going to be Peter O'Brien. He's the BD guy uh, handling uh, government and government contracting. His information is on your lower right-hand corner. So thanks again to our friends at Crown Castle. And we will dig in today to uh, the topic, which is oral presentations. Uh, we wanna thank our speakers. They put a lot of time and effort into this uh, presentation today. Uh, they've worked well together and they've got some great content to share. Uh, First up is Deborah Hurley, and I am remiss in having uh, the write-up with me that I just realized. These guys had sent me a nice little write-up about their background, so Deborah, I'll let you uh, chime in here if you want to uh, give a quick blurb about yourself, and sincere apologies for that. Oh, not a problem at all. Um, I'm an orals coach who's been supporting government oral proposals for 26 years. I have a wonderful team that I work with, and um, I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit about that with you all. Great. Thanks, Deborah. Next up, we've got Troy Comfort. Troy, over to you. Hi there. Um, I work closely with Deb on many FedSim opportunities. Those are very large oral presentations that uh, we jointly work with or our team does. And uh, I just finally found my passion. I was with Lockheed Martin for 18 years, and then I've been doing this for 18 years. So I just absolutely love orals coaching, and it shows. 
<laughs> so anyway, oh, back to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Troy. And Rena, great to have you with us. Thank you. Um, Rena Bhatia, I'm the CEO of Proposal Helper and Bid Execs. We're an 80 employee company now and uh, provide full service business development capture through proposals. Looking forward to talking about all things orals today. Great, yeah. thanks, Rena. And last but not least, uh, Andres Ferra, who has spoken for us in many other uh, government contracting webinars. Webinars. Welcome back, Andres. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, so uh, Andres Ferra here. Uh, I'm an attorney with Offit Kerman. I'm in their uh, their government contracts practice group as well as their business law and transactions group. And uh, I'm a former uh, government contractor myself, and now a government contracts attorney. Um, you know, focusing on uh, everything from bid protest claims, you know, uh, SBA's government contractor programs, and uh, GovCon related mergers and acquisitions. And uh, I'm very excited to uh, to talk on this topic today. Great. Well, thank you guys so much. I think we're going to have a nice uh, presentation just based on the diverse uh, backgrounds that you each bring uh, to the table here. So again, oral presentations, and Deb, I'm going to pop right over to you and we'll Hi. begin and I'll re remind the audience if you guys have questions throughout the presentation please type them in on the right hand side uh, we'll answer those after everyone has gone through their content slides so Deb over to you great start my clock so I stay in time <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer, and it is a joy to be here with everybody. Um, over the years, my team and I have created many best practices, processes, and tools, and I'm gonna share a few of my favorite with you. When I start with a team, one of the first things I ask them is the story. What's the story you're telling? And that's because story is the glue that holds the proposal together. It also helps with scoreability, ease of scoring, and for retention. So we have seen over the years that this story from proposal to proposal, team to team, even company to company, has a lot of uh, similar features that come back. And we created this template that we use kind of to pull out that story. And that's what you're looking at right Right now. So I'm going to start from left to right here. We start with what we bring. What do we bring to it? And at the top there you see our understanding. And our understanding, hopefully you have done all of your capture. <laughs> you've been doing capture for over a year, right? That's what I want to hear. I don't want to hear this as a pop-up. I want to hear you've been doing capture over a year. You have influenced this. You understand this customer. You understand their hot buttons. You understand what keeps them up at night. And you also understand their requirements of what they want. If things have changed, you understand the why behind why things have changed. And you have this understanding, you've hopefully even shaped it and influenced it towards your strengths. So we start with understanding in our story to focus on them. It's a good idea anyhow to start with a focus on them and not us because, you know, they really care about them more than they care about us. <laughs> You know, they they care about us in terms of what we can provide them so they can make the decision they need to make, that they can justify that decision and we need to provide them with what they need to justify. But also what we bring is the right people with the right skills and experience. So we have the right people who have the experience and understand this customer. We also have the right partners and the partners that bring the right skills and the right experience. So. We bring the understanding, the right people, the right partners, and this drives how we're gonna do the work. And the story very often is kind of in, in between there, what we bring and how we, and how we developed our solution, how we develop our approach, our methodologies, our tools. These are all things that we bring to meet their requirements, to meet their goals. Um, and, while we may have best practices and we may have best uh, tools that we use, it's critical that we tailor it because that's another way we show our understanding. How do we tailor it specifically to what they've asked for? And what is our added value? What do we bring in addition to that? Sometimes there are commitments, sometimes there are accelerators, something that we bring in addition that's going to support us meeting their requirements. So we have the story, it moves from left to right. So where are we going? What is their end vision? So these methodologies, these tools, these approach, this solution all lead us to meet not just their requirements, but their objectives, 
their goals and their mission. And one of the things we're looking for in the story is to paint a picture of what does that end state look like? So you've been doing this for three years, let's say five years, 10 years. You have provided them with everything that they've asked for and then some. You've been successful. Now, what does that look like to them? How can you paint a picture of success? And that's part of our story. We're taking them from where they are now to what success is going to look like when you successfully support them to get to the next step. Okay, so that's the high level story. And next I'm going to jump into talking a little bit about the scripting process. So I'm ready for the next slide. I'll take a drink of water. Okay. So in the scripting, this is kind of a cadence for how we do our scripting. And the first thing uh, that we want to think about when we're doing scripting is really the time frame. You know, Troy mentioned FedSim. We do a lot of FedSim. Uh, in FedSim, the slide deck is your technical management approach. And there's a lot of dense information and we don't have a lot of time. So those slides tend to be a minute or less. There are other ones we're working on right now where we have two and a half minutes to slide, so we can talk a lot more, but we still follow this structure, and this helps to focus uh, the presenters. And it looks a little bit like this. You start with your navigation, right? You tell them what you're looking at and how to look at it. Just like when I was talking, I said moving from left to right. That way, and they're not looking around trying to, instead of listening to you, they're not going, okay, where is she? What is she talking about? So. This one, I'll start at first step and I'll work my way down. So your first step is navigating the slides so they know what they're looking at, but they also know how to read it. And then the second step is pulling out those three key points. That's a big part of what we do in our coaching process. We're helping them to identify what the three most important things are that they're going to talk to. And Sometimes that's not easy because there's so much they want to say, and we really want to fine tune it to those three most important things. Three is a good number. People remember three. You give them 12, you give them 30, it's too many. Three is good. So we look at those three key points as being the highlight of how we're going to do the work, or maybe it's the why. And then saying those points isn't enough. We've got to back it up with metrics and proof points, stories that are going to back it up. And then we want to talk to the benefit or value to the customer. So it's the benefit to you is, as a result of this, the value to you is, what are you going to get out of it? And then your transition is the continuation of the story. It could be to the next person. It could be to the next section. It could be, now let's deep dive into this process so we can look at each step of the process. And one of the things that I do want to mention, though, about this scripting process is that while it looks kind of linear, it is quite agile. So you don't necessarily say, okay, here's the three key points. Now here are the three proof points. Now here's the three values. Very often we talk to the key point, the message we're trying to convey, we're backing it up with metrics and then we're telling them what the value is. And it is so uh, important, this step three, because so many times we see uh, teams talking about what they bring without backing up how it happens. You know, this is a great efficiency. Well, how is that efficient? Tell us how to do that. So um, let's just see. Okay, so I do want to mention one other thing about the role of the slide, and that is in terms, I mentioned that in FedSim, the slide is the deliverable. It is evaluated, but in many cases, it's not. Sometimes the slide is just support for the speaker. Sometimes you hand in the slide and it's not evaluated. Sometimes you hand in the slide or you don't even hand in the slide, but you can have them up. In that case, the slide is to support the speaker and to kind of highlight the key messages. But there's different emphasis on the actual slide. So identifying that right up front, the role of the slide is really critical. Okay, let's move on. All right. So a lot of times people ask kind of like, give me the highlight, high level of what to expect in the coaching process beginning to end. Um, so when we're first starting out, we're identifying those three key messages. And very often we're going to pull people into the process who have been part of solutioning. It's going to be your SMEs. It might be your solution architect because we want to know right off the bat, are we hitting the most important things and are we saying it 
in a way um, that's going to convey and that's going to be understood by the customer. And remember, your customer may have different uh, levels of understanding. So you may have to speak about it in different ways in order to convey it to them. Now, in this one-to-one -one coaching session is probably a big piece of what we do as Oral's coaches. And that really is now we've identified the key messages and we're starting to script what we're going to say. And what we're looking for is really a conversational voice. And it's best to pull that conversational voice out if you are actually speaking the words opposed to typing. So if I sit down and I type my script um, or I speak my script and use either, a, a, either audio record it or a transcription app to, to catch it, those are very different words. And I can always tell when somebody sends me their script to review and I read it and I'm like, oh, that was definitely a typed script. <laughs> People don't talk like that. <laughs> so what I like to do in the coaching process is just to ask a lot of questions and to have them talk to me. And so tell me, why is that the most important thing? Or how do you do that? And as they talk, I hear the voice, their voice coming out because we also want them to take ownership of it. And so as they talk, we're pulling that conversational tone out and that conversational tone becomes their script. Uh, we also, during that coaching process, we'll talk about delivery. We will talk about nonverbals. Um, we like to build into the script things like pauses. We like to build into the script emphasis and a conversational tone. Let's say you're giving them a proof point of, a, of a, something that you did, uh, some experience that you had. Um, you may be telling it more in a storytelling voice opposed to just going through a process. Just checking my time. I'm over. Okay, I'm moving quick now. <laughs> so um, we talked about, okay, so table reads. Table reads are really critical. Table reads, so you now have a first draft of your script and we're gonna do a table read. Everybody's gonna read through their script. And the importance of that is that goes back to the story. We have set up stories in the beginning. It is the story is the glue that holds it together, right? And that story we set up has threads we're gonna pull through. But until we hear everybody else, we can't necessarily know where all those threads are. Being able to cross talk. So, as Jennifer said at the beginning, here's a perfect example of how we're going to do whatever. So that's part of our story is being able to pull this, but we have to hear each other. So when we are listening to each other, we are timing to see how we're doing for timing. We are listening to, are we hitting all the marks we need to hit? But also, are we pulling the threads that tell the story? And then afterwards, we talk about it obviously and make adjustments. I mean, rehearse, rehearse, rehearse is of course a big part of what we do. The more you do it, the more comfortable you are and the more opportunities you find to highlight those strengths. Full rehearsals with Q&A um, are a big part of our presentation uh, rehearsing. And in terms of timing, we have a timekeeper and we are consistently going through it until everybody is really comfortable. And I know I'm out of time, Jennifer, so <laughs> if there are any uh, follow-up questions, I will be happy to answer them later. And thank you so much. Hi there, my name's Troy. Uh, I just wanna first, uh, do a shout out or a thank you to Jennifer for providing this forum. Also to my fellow panelists, to our sponsors, and certainly to all of you who are spending a portion of your Friday. What a nice excuse to have to shave on a Friday. I love it in today's world. But anyway, it's great to be here with you. I want to talk about the Q&A or the question and answer process. So we've done, we've received our RFP and we see that there's an orals component to it. And we have prepared for that. We've prepared our team. We have PowerPoint slide specialists. We have coaches that we've identified. And now we have this presentation that we have to do. Okay, great. And we're going to follow all of Deb's advice, her great processes, all of our lessons learned, and we nail a fantastic presentation. Well, that's part of it. And now the next part of it comes live, and that is the Q&A. That is when they literally can open the hood of that vehicle. You know, they can open the the hood of your car, look underneath and go, oh, okay. 
I have a question on slide 15, or I have a slide specifically for this subject matter expert to announce X, Y, and Z, or, or to answer X, Y, and Z. Well, to me, this is the most important time when the customer can see, okay, they could have rehearsed any and all of this, but now it's live, it's real, it's us with them. The evaluator can see exactly what that subject matter expert is. And more importantly, they'll see what I call in orals, it's the ultimate team sport. And that is when you'll find out exactly how this team will perform for you. Uh, of course, we coach this and whatnot, but it gives them that first glimpse of truly knowing and seeing this is the team I'm about to hire or I'm evaluating them for the potential to hire them for this multi-year contract with millions of dollars online. So uh, the Q&A process is absolutely essential and something that I just am always, you know, saying, hey, let's, let's don't forget time for this. So we back out in our schedule for that. So uh, just wanted you to know that. Obviously, we uh, also wanted to get in there that we have our work cut out for us because public speaking and, and specifically when you get into Q&A, uh, it still is among the top four and sometimes the top one of fears that people have, according to Psychology Today magazine. Our top four fears in the world are public speaking. So all four of us are here to alleviate that for any and all of you. But taking a look at Q&A real quickly, uh, we want to do a, a quick and the first thing you want to do is make sure that why did the evaluator ask this question? So key off those key words of if they ask how, what, and where, the how is the process, the what is what's your methodology, how is that integrated with both your management and your technical solution, and then certainly if they're asking a where question, it's, you know, how are you uh, geographically dispersed or CONUS, con o CONUS, those types of things, okay? And then following down through the next uh, numbers here, two through five, provide a quick, succinct, and pithy answer. We all love the word pithy. So, uh, we want to do that, and I'm going to get pithy here real quickly. Uh, what's the opportunity that we have then to uh, put that cherry on the top? When we answer that question, adding that extra value and benefit, what's the direct benefit to our customer by uh, how we answered this? When's it appropriate to summarize when it isn't? It always is appropriate, unless it's just simply a yes, no. And finally, we want to answer the question that was asked. Next slide. Okay, scenario-based, uh, Q&A best practices for uh, scenario-based. Uh, Rena is really going to do a deeper dive in it. That is her specialty. Uh, it is something that we're seeing on almost all uh, orals now is they want not only to see what your presentation is, but then they give you a pop-up or a real live demonstration that they want you to say, hey, what would you do in this particular scenario? Clearly, you wanna do these things. You wanna make sure that you understand, again, what are they wanting out of this scenario? What questions are they asking uh, related to that? Uh, why did they ask that question? What's the answer? So and so. I'd like to really jump down to that bottom bullet. And this is really the recipe for success that we have found. And that is truly what is our understanding of their scenario? Uh, any assumptions that we need to provide to them that was part of our solution, i.e. they might have left out intentionally or unintentionally key components of the information that we need. So we need to make sure that we say our solution was created based on these assumptions. We wanna, again, stick with our approach, our solution, our process and tools. We don't abandon those all of a sudden in Q&A or when the scenario comes in front of us, we don't wanna abandon what we just showed them, what we just told them. We're gonna tell them, tell them again. And as Deb was talking about, always come back to that value and the benefit of using our tools, our proven processes, and certainly the experts that we have brought in front of you as our subject matter experts. Uh, the proof points are always valuable. Obviously, all of us who have ever bought anything, purchased anything ourselves, uh, we wanna know, we look at those reviews or we wanna ask somebody who has that, a similar uh, item. And we wanna know what's that proof that 
I can have the confidence that you will do for me what you did for this customer. Uh, examples and stories, innovations are wonderful and things that we want to stick to. And finally, we want to showcase what's different about us and how do we understand our customer? What's unique? How do we bring that bridge together that we can say we are different from our competitors and here is why and here is how. And we want to really hammer home and we call it foot stomping in the defense world, I guess, more so than others. But we want to foot stomp. What's that? true benefit in our answer to their question. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, I always like to leave people with a checklist and reminders, it just helps. Uh, here are a few, I'll just uh, talk about a couple of them. But again, going back to my point about that Orals is the ultimate team sport, Q&A is where that is truly realized. And we need to capture all the questions. Everybody has an assignment that's on that team. So everybody's writing down that question, capturing that question. Clearly in today's world, we might be doing that, uh, you know, in live orals, you're doing it with a pen and ink. Uh, otherwise you might be using Teams or uh, Google uh, or whatever uh, medium that the, customers ask us to use. So we want to capture all the questions. And then therefore, when we do decide to caucus and come back together, that each of us has uh, our question down, we make sure we get the question and then maybe somebody has a different take on that. We want to introduce all of those different aspects of the potential answer that we want to give. We want to practice in that huddle uh, what we would say back to our customer. I like to always say we're going to state the answer, we're going to provide and support what is our evidence, why this answer makes sense, and then ultimately always ending with the direct benefit to our customer directly. So uh, if they have mentioned in their question to us, if they have cited a particular person, uh, they rarely do that, but they'll um, often uh, refer to a slide, we'll include that slide number and its uh, title, if you will, or its subject matter in your response. So if they say on, fifth, on slide 15, when you were talking about how great, uh, you know, your umpty ump was going to be, I mean, we just want to say, as you asked on slide 15, uh, we want you to know, ex you, we just re- count what did i say about that go through the same three points i love what deb just said the series of three and say what that is so if they're talking about the customer portal that you say you're going to provide then talk to them about the value of that portal and the three major uh direct benefits that they would get from that uh there's a number of other things here on the checklist reminders i just want to say to all of you on this call please linkedin or uh, please uh, link in with me, uh, link in with all the panelists, and uh, I always have time for you, and I will always make time for you, uh, and any questions that you have going forward, I'd like to entertain those today live. Okay, now I'd like to turn it over to Rena, who is going to do a deeper dive into scenario-based responses. Rena? Thank you, Troy, and thank you, Deb, for setting the stage and pretty much covering everything so far. Um, and then when the panelists were discussing how we're going to present this information to all of you, there's a pattern to it if you have not already caught on to it, right? Deb gave you an overall. This is regardless of what oral presentations, those rules apply. And then Troy went into a little bit more about when you have, uh, you're presenting your slides, you have time to prepare your slides, even if they're scenario based. You are preparing them, submitting them with your proposal, and then going into orals. I'm going to go a little bit further and talk about when your proposal instructions tell you there will be orals, but no slides allowed, don't submit them with your proposal. We will let you know when you show up on our site, when you're gonna show up on government site, and we will give you the scenario on the spot. How do you do that? How do you prepare for something like that? Uh, and we are seeing this becoming more and more prevalent where the government wants to say, my problem is I keep getting these pop-up issues with my code or 
last minute changes in my code, I'd like to see how your team is actually gonna handle that. And I'm not gonna give you any time to prepare. Let's see how you do. So there are the government orals presentation. Uh, it used to be submit your slides, present. Now they're going to a um, little bit more of a, hey, I'm gonna interview this team on site. So some of the challenges that we are seeing with these uh, oral presentation on-site scenarios uh, that are popping up, companies, you really have to prepare even for those. Even though you don't know what the scenario is, you have to prepare for those. Um, if you uh, can go to the next slide, please. Um, and how do you prepare for something like that? Have your team that you have proposed ready. They have to know that, you know, typically the government will tell you that you may get called between this, these are our dates that we're looking at. So have your team available in town. If they have vacation planned, have a backup plan. You know, well, how if that your key person is a contingent hire, what are you going to do? Please have a plan in place. Uh, calling the proposal manager and saying, we just call, got called for a scenario uh, orals next week and my key person is out of country. What do I do? Uh, so please make sure you plan for that early. Uh, and as Dev was talking about scripting, you can still script early. You can still have a game plan. And the way to do that is understanding the statement of work. And I bring up in my, on my slide, I specifically say even your C-level executive who's going to show up and be present at that uh, scenario or that meeting, they also have to know the statement of work. I cannot emphasize enough. I've walked into an oral scenario where we were asked to be part of, we were allowed to be with the team and the CEO had no clue what the statement of work was asking. At a high level, somebody had given them a synopsis before they made the first bid, no bid decision. The CEO walked in with that understanding. It was embarrassing, very embarrassing. So please make sure your team is prepared. People are in town, that they have some dates in mind and you have backup personnel in place and that every person has read the statement of work and what the problem is. You can practice scenarios based on that. They're not, the government is not gonna give you a scenario outside of what their objectives and statement of work requirements are. So you have some idea of what that scenario could possibly be. So please make sure you read and understand that. Have your technical team read the objectives. I, they don't silo. Oh, I am a systems architect. I'm only going to read task one. I don't care about task four. No, everybody reads all the RFP task areas because what the government is wanting to do they're not checking your technical skills. They know that you are one key person out of an 80 person team, that you are not the only coder that's going to show up. They know that. What they're checking is what Troy mentioned. They wanna see how you work as a team. Can you solve a problem, right? So if you don't know what task four is and you say, my job is just task one, I don't care about task four, you're not a team player anymore. So every person needs to know every task. They don't have to be experts in it, but at least know that that was part of statement of work. Read your own proposal. Every person that is going to show up to the orals or scenario, please know what you said in your proposal. We have had scenarios in practice, thank goodness, where one person goes off on a tangent saying this is how they manage projects, and the proposal was completely different. The org chart, they had not even looked at what the org chart said. Please don't do that. Every person who is going to be part of the orals and during implementation should know what your proposal said. So give them copies of that. In fact, we recommend you take printed copies with you if that is allowed during orals. A copy of the RFP, statement of work, you don't have to have the entire binder, with the reps and certs and all of that, but at least the statement of work and your proposal. What we do is we give each speaker their section separately. So if we say you are the solution architect, this is what we had said about your section, but they still have a copy of the whole thing, 
right? They please take that with you because sometimes, you know, hey, I'm hunting around for the file. Let me see where it is. We don't want to do all that. Uh, these orals can be very time limited. We don't want them wasting time. So go in prepared, read your proposal and have a game plan before. Obviously, Deb and Co uh, Troy covered the before part. How do you prepare? What, how do you uh, plan your scripting and all of that during when you are on government site, the scenario has been presented to you before the government starts the timer. What questions do you want to ask? Who is going to ask the questions? Who is your program manager for that little project right there? That's a little project, right? Your oral is 90 minutes. Who is going to ask questions so that not everybody is talking on top of each other uh, and confusing the government with repeated questions? Have that game plan in place. Who is recording what the government is saying? Who is your script taker? These are your minutes of the meeting. Remember, that's what you promised, your standard process. We will have a person taking minutes of the meeting. What is somebody taking minutes of the meeting during your planning, pro during the orals? Whatever you promised in your proposal, demonstrate you do it right there. Show them. Not only did we say this in our proposal, but we're treating this little orals as our project. And look, we're doing exactly what we said. This is our standard process. So do it. After you have presented, everything has gone smoothly. Kudos. We gave you the, uh, you know, the coding challenge. Your guys came through or your gals came through with flying colors before you walk out of the room. What are you going to ask the government? Are you allowed to ask questions of what next? Can we follow up with you? When can we hear from you? Make it, it is not a, hey, you know, we are standoffish. You guys are the government. We are the contractor. It is a client and a company relationship at the end of the day. And just like you would ask a customer, when can I follow up with you? Is it okay if I follow up with you? Ask. If the government says no follow-ups, we'll get back to you, respect that. Please do not then go back to your office and start calling the government of, hey, when am I going to hear from you? They told you, please don't. So respect what they tell you, but it's okay to ask. And I really liked what Deb and Troy said. During the presentation, be a person. Don't be a robot, right? You're not, don't talk to the slides if slides are, uh, is what you're presenting. Tell them, you know your trade. You're good at what you do. I am sometimes really baffled, even during proposal process, when companies say, well, how do, how, what should we say about how we do recruiting? You're a 500 person company. You're obviously recruiting today. Why don't you just tell them what you do? <laughs> so it, make it a personal thing. Don't make it too standoffish. You are the government, I'm the contractor. Respect boundaries, but they are interviewing you as a team. And at the end of the day, they're interviewing your ability to solve problems. Whether you get the answer right or wrong in whatever scenario they have given you, whether it's a coding scenario, whether this is our problem, how will you solve it? They're not looking for the exact right or wrong answer. What they're looking for is your process. What they're looking for is, as Troy mentioned, do I want to work with you? Do you have the noggins to solve my problem? And are you personable enough to where you're not saying it's my way or the highway? Are you flexible? If I come and change the problem halfway through, if the organization's issue right now is every time a regulation changes, they got to change their code. And if you're in an agile development, my God, you know, your sprint is getting messed up. If that's the scenario they have presented, what they're looking for is how flexibly will you work with us, right? That's, so please know that they're interviewing, not just you for your skills, but interviewing to see if they wanna work with you and are you a problem solver? So um, I really think every, you know, you're not, got, you're not getting to that point unless you have the skills to get to that point. Demonstrate it. And uh, I like what Troy said, public speaking, the fear of public speaking. If you go in prepared, you have read what their requirements are. You have read what you have proposed. It's a matter of repeating it, right? There's nothing new you're coming up with. You're repeating what you have said you will do for them. 
and you're just doing it verbally. So there's no reason for you to fear it as long as you haven't faked it. So go in prepared. Uh, wonderful tips by Dev and Troy. Build up on that, whether it is you have time to prepare or right there on the spot, you have to do it. Uh, we think you can do it. So as I said, go wild them and win those contracts. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Andres. Thanks, Rena, and, and thanks to Dev and Troy as well. Um, you know, it, it's a lot of you know great uh, stuff there, and and you know lots of good best practices and sort of the understanding of you know sort of what this looks like and how best to approach it. But it, what I wanted to do to to kind of close things out is to you know kind of talk through a little bit of you know the sort of at the meta level of you know what is an oral presentation, and the reason why it's important to sort of understand this is is really to sort of understand the context of you know, what are your uh, rights and obligations, right, as, as an offeror? And what are the agency's uh, responsibilities? And all of this is to make sure that the oral uh, uh, pre presentation process is, is done in a way that is in compliance with the FAR and in compliance with the, the terms of the solicitation. And really, this is to make sure that uh, if you do the orals well and you, you think everything went well and, uh, and you don't get the award, uh, whether there might be an opportunity to protest and to uh, to see if you can you know get that award decision uh, overturned, um, or if you get the award and uh, and you know an oral presentation is is central to a protest that arises from another offer or um, whether you can intervene and uh, and defend the uh, the agency's award decision alongside them. Um, so to to kind of you know get our hands wrapped around that, uh, we need to kind of take a step back and understand what is an oral presentation under the FAR. Um, and the, uh, the FAR has all that of a, a single section that is uh, not ex extremely detailed about uh, what uh, oral presentations are, and, uh, and it's under uh, FAR uh, section 15.102. Um, and really, it doesn't strictly define the term, which is commonplace in the FAR. Um, what it basically does is it, it sort of says more about what it's not than what it is. Um, and it all kind of boils down to this, interactivity is key. Right, so the, the FAR uh, provision states that pre-recorded videotape presentations that don't have that interactive dialogue that we've been talking about so far, uh, those are not oral presentations, right? Um, so, you know, it's, it's important to sort of understand when we're in oral presentation land so that we can understand you sort of what those, uh, those rights are, right? So, um, you know, also what this FAR provision basically says is uh, what types of information can be uh, included. And, you know, basically the, the thing to kind of fall back on is, is to think of oral presentations as this is a part of your proposal, right? If, if that you know, wasn't clear, uh, that's, that's something that you should certainly walk away with um, because even though they're not a written portion, they, they really are an actual part of your proposal, right? And so that's, that's an a important thing to sort of keep in mind, right? And so um, the, the FAR lays out some things that can be included um, in the the oral presentation, and it reads a lot like the type of uh, you know stuff that you would see in a in a solicitation as to the different sections of your proposal, right? Looking at your capability, your past performance, solution staffing, etc. Right? Um, but the agency has a lot of uh, discretion as to you know what they can include and the the structure of it. So there's there's quite a bit of uh, of, of leeway for the agency to uh, to to sort of you know decide uh, you know what this is going to look like. Um, and, uh, and, you know, as, uh, you know, Rita talked through, you know, they can be, you know, specific tasks and tests and, uh, and all that sort of stuff is, is, you know, is named in the FAR clause as, uh, you know, potential pieces, uh, of the, uh, the oral presentation. Um, so this all kind of comes back to, you know, what are the agency's responsibilities, right? We've talked a lot about, you know, how, you know, what your responsibilities are as offerors, um, but, uh, we need to, you know, dig into, you know, what does the agency have to do? Um, so, you know, given that uh, oral presentations are effectively a part of your, uh, your proposal, uh, they're, they're really subject to the same sort of competition and content restrictions as that of written proposals, right? So, uh, you know, the solicitation has to be, you know, pretty clear about, um, you know, what goes into uh, the oral presentation. Again, there's you know, there's a lot of discretion uh, again for the agency, but uh, but it's really sort of overarching rule is that they have to provide you with sufficient information to allow you to to sort of uh, prepare for them in terms of you know the format and the the scope of the information that's going to be dis disclosed 
um, and uh, you know the qualifications of uh, of participating personnel. As as Rena mentioned before, you know having the the right people there and making sure that they're in town and you know able to participate that's all critical. And when we get to the next slide, well that'll that'll become even more clear. Um, now you know one of the the, the interesting uh, obligations uh, of the the uh, the requirements here on the agency is that they actually have to document uh, oral presentations, right? So this is all about you know kind of building that contract file um, that sort of uh, it supports their their ultimate award decision, right? Um, that's a critical part of any acquisition process, and it's you know often an issue in any protest. Um, so, uh, so the FAR does specifically note that, uh, that the government's required to document what they relied upon in the oral presentations that led them to their, their source selection decision. Um, but the method and the level of detail um, uh, is, is sort of up to the agency. So they, they can videotape it. Uh, they could uh, just do audio recordings. Or they can just take, you know, uh, contemporaneous notes uh, as long as they're in, you know, uh, enough detail to really support the uh, the decision that they made or the evaluation, um, you know, as it relates to the uh, the oral presentation. Uh, that's that's usually enough for uh, uh, for that to uh, to pass muster if there is a protest. Um, and then, you know, you know finally, uh, you know, one of the uh, the the big uh, ordeals here is is that, uh, you know. Uh, oral presentations, when there is something that is a truly material term to the ultimate contract uh, that comes up in an oral presentation and isn't necessarily reflected in the proposal or in the contract, um, then that needs to be reduced to writing. So, for example, uh, if uh, you know, during the, the oral presentation, uh, you have a discussion with the government about uh, certain key personnel and sort of everybody you know, comes to the conclusion, you know what, maybe this key personnel that we named is the right one, it should be this person, right? You have to follow up in in writing uh, to, uh, to to you know make any of those sorts of changes to the material terms uh, of the the agreement, even though it's you know something that that occurred during the uh, uh, the oral uh, presentations. Um, so uh, now uh, you know with that in mind, we've kind of got an idea of, of what this looks like. Let's uh, learn from uh, the the horror stories uh, of the protests. So if you can go to the next slide, please. All right, so um, the the protests are, are often a, a good place to land when when you're talking about you know what can go wrong in in oral presentations. You're not going to see quite as many protests that are going to you know show about you know when things go right because they just don't make it into the cases often. <laughs> um, so uh, so we're going to start with talking about a a, a case called Brooks Range uh, Contract Services. Um, and so you know what what happened here uh, is that uh, the uh, the the offeror. Um, you know, basically was, uh, didn't do, uh, you know, maybe the, the best job uh, in their, their oral presentation. They, they didn't listen to, uh, to folks like my, my co-panelists here, uh, and uh, so maybe they, they phoned it in a little bit. Um, and so uh, they ended up getting a, a lower evaluation score uh, because of what happened during their oral presentation. But they objected in, in the, uh, the Government Accountability Office in a protest saying, well, wait a second, Oral presentations wasn't named as an evaluation factor in the solicitation, so you know I, I shouldn't get dinged because I didn't do well there, right? My uh, my written proposal was great, uh, and so that that should be you know what the uh, award decision was made on. Um, and GAO said no, we disagree. Even though that the uh, the RQ didn't explicitly name the oral presentation as uh, an evaluation factor, it's still a part of the proposal. And the fact that you have to give an oral presentation. Uh, means that it's reasonable for the agency to uh, to lower their evaluation score based on you know, what happened during it, right? And so, uh, so they ended up denying the protest, and uh, and so the the takeaway from this is that oral presentations matter, um, even if they're they're not something that's mentioned explicitly in in the evaluation criteria portion of the the uh, solicitation. You still need to uh, definitely you know pay some attention and uh, and make sure that they they go well and. And I'm sure that you know, given that you're you know uh, looking at at this uh, either this recording or participating live, you probably know that they're they're important. But uh, but it's always you know good to uh, to see what can happen if you really don't take them seriously. Um, so uh, 
So next we're going to talk about uh, business management associates, and um, you know I'll I'll jump to the the takeaway before I, I talk through it, but uh, but it's it's basically you always want to have a backup plan, and so when uh, Rena was was talking about you know having backup plans in terms of you know the the, the people that are there, and in terms of you know kind of the the content of your your oral presentation, that's really key. You you, you definitely need to have a backup plan. And this this case, which is a little bit dated, it was uh, in the early 2000s. Um, but I think it's particularly relevant in this sort of post-COVID uh, environment. Um, so what happened here is that um, the oral presentations were conducted over video conference. Um, and uh, this uh, offeror uh, unfortunately had some, uh, some issues with their internet. Uh, so there was, you know, they were cutting in and out and there was delays and all sorts of stuff that, that sort of, you know, made, made this an issue, right? And um, what ended up happening is, is the agency actually, um, you know, gave them a, a lower evaluation rating because of that. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this uh, offeror said, well, that's not really fair. You know, I, I you know, I'm, I'm sorry that I had those issues, but, you know, but the, again, it's the content of my proposal was great. And the content of my oral presentation was great, even though I had those, those sorts of, uh, you know, issues. But the agency kind of said, well, yes, but you didn't really have a backup plan. Um, and so when that started having, uh, you know, when you started having issues, you couldn't have, you know, somebody else, you know, step in or, uh, or, or something along those lines. And that honestly raises kind of a performance concern because guess what, when you're performing a contract, often you have to be, you know, able to, uh, to adjust on the fly. Um, so this, this again, you know, went to GAO and, uh, GAO, uh, sided with the agency. Um, saying, you know, it's, it's completely reasonable. Um, you know, part of the purpose of oral presentations is to, to make sure that um, you kind of have your, your stuff together. And part of that is, is having a backup plan for when things go wrong. So, uh, so they, they sided with the agency there. Uh, so if you could go to the next slide, we'll talk about two more cases. All right, so, uh, so now we have our, our first case that's coming out of a court, uh, the Court of uh, Federal Claims. And, uh, and that's uh, uh, Bean Stuyvesant versus the United States. Um, and here, uh, this is another one that sort of, you know, relates uh, back to uh, Tarina's comment about, uh, you know, having the right, you know, folks in the room. Um, so this, the solicitation in this case uh, required that the, uh, the project manager be the presenter. And this, this often happens, we see this uh, increasingly, where the agency wants to hear from the folks that are going to be doing the work on the ground. Um, or at least the people who are going to be, you know, exhibiting, you know, kind of direct managerial control over those folks, right? They're not as interested in hearing from the CEO who's, you know, not going to be, you know, deeply involved in, in the project. And so, um, you know, who the presenter is, is, uh, is really important. And that's increasingly the case. So anyways, in, in this case, the, uh, the oral presentation uh, was scheduled. Um, and, uh, you know, again, backing up to, to Rena's point, right, they, they moved it a couple of times. And when it, when it landed, the, this, uh, this project manager was on vacation. Uh, and so what ended up happening is, is that instead of, you know, trying to work with the agency to maybe reschedule it or, or something along those lines, uh, they, they ended up having um, one of their, their uh, C-suite level executives give the, uh, the presentation. And the agency gave them a lower evaluation score solely because of that. They, basically, the agency said, look, it was great. Uh, we just didn't hear from the person that we wanted to hear from, right? And so, um, you know, because of that, they, uh, they lowered the evaluation score. And, uh, and there, was, there was a few other issues that, that were going on in this uh, particular protest. Uh, but uh, the agency, you know, did, uh, you know, the, the protester, you know, did focus at least in part on, uh, on this issue. And uh, the, the court basically sided again with, with the agency, you know, saying, you know, look, the solicitation was very clear about who we want to hear from. Uh, that person wasn't there. And for that reason, it's more than reasonable for the, uh, for the agency to, uh, to lower the, the rating. Um, so, uh, so the takeaway here is, you know, make sure you're using the right presenter or presenters, um, and, uh, and also, you know, make sure that they're, they're really, you know, uh, the, the person that, that the government wants to hear from, even if they, uh, sit in the role that the solicitation might say, um, that, uh, that they need to sit in, like the, the project manager, they also, you know, really need to have a good understanding of, uh, all the contents of the uh, the proposal, and to make sure that they can speak intelligently about about this stuff, and to be able to to you know frankly answer some of the Q and A uh, stuff that you know Troy mentioned. That's that's all critical here. Um, so uh, so that's that's definitely important um, you know takeaway from here. 
Um, and then finally, uh, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the, the big guys in uh, government contracting, uh, Booz Allen Hamilton, this is a, a, a recent case that, uh, that they brought, um, and it was about an oral presentation that, uh, that they gave that was uh, for a, a, a complex uh, you know, procurement. Um, but uh, one of the things that the oral presentation in this case uh, was really supposed to focus on was the transition out and transition in uh, plans. And, uh, and so because of that, uh, you know, the, the offerors were supposed to, you know, really kind of dig into, into that into particular detail in addition to sort of the work that was going to be happening in between. Um, and so the, uh, you know, Booz Allen Hamilton's PowerPoint slides for this, this presentation covered those those issues in in detail right and um but the uh the issue was is that uh during the oral presentation themselves basically booz allen hamilton spent about 80 percent of their time on transition in um which understandable right you know that's more of your your type of work and transition out is you you know handing the keys to somebody else and so often you you know that's not as important to you as a business but it was important to this agency um, and Booz Allen Hamilton spent uh, very little time on their, their transition out plan. Um, and even though their PowerPoint presentation went into it in detail, um, they, they just didn't spend enough time in the, uh, in the estimation of the agency. And making matters worse, they ended their, uh, their oral presentation with time to spare. Um, so the agency gave them a lower rating for failing to adequately cover the transition out plan. Um, and you know, Booz Allen Hamilton protested saying, you know, look, you know, our proposal goes into detail about this. Our, you know, PowerPoint slides went into a lot of detail. We know we didn't cover it maybe in as much depth as the agency wanted during the oral presentation, but uh, they've got the information that they need. So we should have gotten a, a lower score. Well, GAO disagreed and they, they upheld that rating as reasonable, you know, because they said, look, you know, part of what the this process is for is, is not just to understand those processes and procedures, but we're also looking at, you know, whether you have the skill set to uh, to do the work in the right way. And part of that is budgeting your time and covering the topics that uh, that they really want uh, to be covered as as you know part of that presentation. Uh, that's the sort of thing that reflects on what your performance is going to be like during contract performance. And so, uh, so that's that's a, a, a key point that uh, that they want to see come across in in the oral presentation. So, takeaway here is is make sure you're budgeting your time, and make sure that you're covering all the key topics in full. And uh, and you know that's that's the uh, the the four you know cases that I thought were were going to be illuminating here. Uh, and uh, you know hopefully uh, you you took some lessons from it. And uh, you know we'll we'll keep on going with the uh, the Q and A and uh, you know turn it back to you, Jennifer. Sorry, I think I was muted. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so, Deborah, first question over to you is why hire an oral coach? Well, I think that Andres just answered that question. <laughs> 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 Everything he talked about are the reasons why. All those things are things that we ensure don't happen, right? right. Um, it, one of the things, <laughs> the oral coaching field has really uh, evolved. You know, in, in 1995, when I started with the rewrite of the FAR 15, as you were mentioning, <laughs> we were presentation coaches. And what we did uh, was mostly the end of the process. We worked with people on their delivery. We worked on them on how um, how they were going to stand. And, and you were saying, Andres was saying about, you know, that the, these key people are not presenters, they're experts in their field. So they don't necessarily have the presentation skills. Um, and they don't particularly love that they have to do this. I mean, there are very few teams that I go and they're like, oh, yay, we have orals. We can't wait. <laughs> they don't want to do this. So I'm um, working with them. So we started at the end of the process. And slowly over the years, what's happened is it's moved to the beginning of the process because we would get in and we would coach them. And then what, ha what happened is we would impact what's on the slides, but guess what? Slides were already submitted too late. Ah, next time we'll bring you in a little earlier so you can have influence on the slides. Influence on the messaging, the story, the takeaways, the wind themes, all that stuff. So now we're all the way, we're so far back to the beginning now that sometimes we actually coach groups of people, or not groups of people, a, a capture manager and a, a program manager who are going in to meet with the client prior to the RFP even coming out. 
Um, so we facilitate these processes to ensure that everybody uh, on the team is getting what they need to be the very best. Um, part of what we're doing is also looking at the balance. You, these team, these people are really smart. They're much smarter than I am. They know so much. They don't know the balance because they can go down a rabbit hole really easily. So we're pulling ourselves back and listening to the information and saying, you know, okay, well, how deep do you have to go to really illustrate that you understand, but not so deep that we're going to lose our audience? Very often our, our uh, source selection board, our tab, our evaluators, uh, there's a mixed group. Not everybody. You may have someone who's very technical, but you may also have other people in there. Who are and and certainly in the case of FedSim, you have your FedSim people and you have the government, so um, your government client. So finding that balance and being able to uh, support that in terms of hitting what you have to hit to be compliant, to be easily scorable, but also you have a time restraint and you have to keep within the time. In addition to that, some of the things that we're doing is we're driving a schedule. We're creating a schedule that is kind of a swim lane. It's it's going along with everything else. And we're working closely, uh, very often working very closely with the capture manager, with the proposal manager, with the solution architects, so that we're making sure that all the things that are priorities to them are coming out in the presentation. Um, and that's kind of it in a nutshell. <laughs> Can I add just a couple of things? Oh, go ahead, Troy. That's wonderful, Deb. Uh, the wealth of lessons learned that we bring. Uh, we, we have seen, you. you by the way, I don't want to say you've seen it all because the minute you say it, the next team uh, defies that <laughs> and gives you a whole new lessons learned. But it's the wealth of lessons learned that we have over 10, 15, 20 years seen. Uh, we've we've seen the hard way or we've seen it a good way or we've seen it in between. And we've tried this, we've tried that. And then we can bring you the best knowledge that we have that this team can try out and then this team then will decide and we'll see it uh, in our in front of our very eyes whether that is successful or not and lastly we're, we get to become something that a uh, their capture manager can't be to them a fellow colleague can't be to them or a c-suite uh, executive cannot be we become a friend, and I'm not saying that any of these people aren't friends with them, but we become their friend, their confidant, their psychiatrist, uh, their part-time whatever. I mean, we simply, in fact, I start usually with any team that I'm working with individually with each of the presenters. We're talking about their children, their grandchildren, anything but orals, anything about this proposal. Because I first and foremost want to know about them as an individual. And then that informs me so much more on how I will individually tailor my coaching to that individual. So I just wanted to add those two things. Jennifer? That's great. great. Yeah, and we're a little tight on time, guys. So we've got some questions coming in and we still need to buzz through everybody. So I'm going to keep uh, keep the slides moving here. So Troy, uh, what do you find most important in the question and answer session process? Okay. Uh, it is the teamwork uh, and exactly what Rena was saying is plan for the contingencies and the issues that are going to come up in a Q&A session. But first, just have a plan and rehearse that plan. So we're going to start with our program manager. He or she is going to be the master of ceremonies, and we're going to make sure that everybody on that team, if it's a panel, or I'm sorry, if there's six or seven or eight uh, key personnel, they each have an assignment. So rehearse rehearse, rehearse. That is the key to Q&A and looking like a cohesive team. Jennifer? Great, thank you. And uh, Raina, over to you. How can you prepare if the scenario won't be revealed until you are in the room? Well, I mean, it's it's the core of my presentation, what I just said is, first of all, have the right people there. Read the statement of work ahead of time. Your scenario is gonna come out of that. If you understand the problem that was, uh, in the statement of work, if your team understands that, they can handle pretty much any scenario that's thrown at you. But please don't hesitate to ask the government questions ahead of time. If it's going to be a coding related uh, scenario, will we have access to the software that we're going to need? Will we have access to computers or do we bring our own? Ask the questions ahead of time, go in prepared, don't make assumptions. 
please don't go walk in thinking, well, I thought you were going to give me the software. Don't walk in that way. And Troy, what you um, were saying, you know, having those key personnel, please have your key personnel or whoever is going to be in the room presenting, talk to each other before they show up. The first time if they're shaking hands going, hey, nice to meet you in front of the government. <laughs> please don't do that. Have your team meet each other at least for coffee if they've not seen each other before you walk into the government's office. <laughs> Great. And uh, Andres, uh, when do oral presentations become discussions and what is the effect of that distinction? Yeah, uh, so discussions are, are you know, a super important term in, in government contracting. So what discussions are is, is when the government basically gives you an opportunity to either uh, you know, revise your proposal in some way uh, or to address particular concerns that the government has uh, about your proposal uh, that are going to be central to their, their source selection decision. So this often comes up in the Q&A context, right? If the, if the agency uh, you know, asks a, a particular set of questions around uh, your proposal during uh, oral presentations, it may become discussions, especially if they offer you the opportunity to, uh, to go back and, and submit a, uh, a revision of a proposal. Um, so the, the issue with discussions is that discussions have to be fair and they have to be meaningful. So if you are getting the opportunity uh, to, uh, to be able to revise your proposal, all the other offerors uh, that, uh, that, that have that you know, same sort of you know, uh, issue in their, uh, their proposals, they have to be offered the, the same opportunity. Um, so that's a, that's a key you know, distinction in, in, uh, in the Q&A process. Uh, and the same thing goes for if the agency has super uh, you know, important concerns about uh, your, uh, your proposal and they engage in these sorts of discussions, um, they have to raise that same concern with other offerors who have the same issue, right? They can't just raise it with one offeror and not raise it to another. So discussions can come up in the context of oral presentations whenever you, know, you, you sort of have those sorts of situations. And it's key to, to understand when that's happening and if you can to find out when it's happening for other offerors because if you're faced with an opportunity to, uh, if you're denied the opportunity to address an issue that another offeror uh, was able to address, then that you know, will give you a, a potential basis to protest. So, uh, so it's important to, to sort of you know, understand uh, the, you know, the context of the government's questions and whether they amount to these discussions because that, that can have real consequences. Great, thanks. And Deborah, back to you. Uh, yeah, we'll try to keep these fast. Uh, for the past year and a half, most oral proposals have gone mostly virtual. Please share a few best practices specific for this version of orals. Great question. Okay. Oh, goodness. I could talk an hour just about this. <laughs> All right. So March 13th, Friday the 13th, 2020, we were in a proposal room and they sent us home. And this is kind of was a silver lining to this. And that is we thought originally that things would slow down maybe a little bit, but they didn't. They actually got faster and there were more proposals than we've ever seen, but they were all virtual. And so uh, Hurley Group uh, put our heads together, my team, and we came up with our best practices and our processes for doing these type of orals. Um, and there are really two, two categories, let's just say. There's the category of the customer. Uh, what is the customer's platform? And then we want to find that out early on. Uh, what platform are they using? Is it Teams? Is it, if it's FedSim, it's probably a Google Meet. Is it WebEx? Is it Zoom? And we've seen it all. And who's initiating that platform? In other words, are we, uh, are we, are we starting, are we sending them out a link? Or are they sending us? Now, most of the time, it is the government sending us the link. But we've had a few where they told us to send it to them because we want to practice the way we're going to play. So we want to know what it's going Going to be like the other thing is some people don't re or some teams don't realize you can ask for a comm check you can ask them and we've only been turned down i think once when we've asked for that where we can actually set a time and say we just want to make sure we've got a good connection and going back to the point that andres said is we always have a backup 
you know, we've had a number of situations where something didn't work and we had the app on our phone and we, there was no time lost. Also, everybody has each other's scripts so that if someone needs to jump in and continue, we can do that. So from the perspective of the interaction with the customer, we want to practice with whatever platform that is. Now, the other part of this, and I know you wanted me to be quick, but is us, where are we? Where are we physically? Are we in our living room? Where are we in our home office? What does that look like? What's the framing like? You know, you look at my framing here. Are you close enough that you can have, I'm looking directly into the camera. Are you practicing looking into the camera so you can make eye contact? What's the mic? And I'm using a mic or using headphones. Um, what am I wearing? What's the lighting like? If everybody's in the same room, how are we doing that so we're not getting feedback? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to stop there because otherwise okay. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> Super. And Troy, how do you rehearse Q&A best practices or uh, process? Sure. Well, I think Deb just uh, nailed almost every one of the things, and that is that you practice, practice, practice. So if, it, if this, if orals is indeed the ultimate team sport, then we have to have a playbook. We have individual coaching, we have our table reads, and then in Q&A, we envision and we solicit and we collect questions that we would believe our customers and our evaluators are going to ask of us. And we collect those and then we begin to practice those. We give each person a role within that. Again, the program manager is typically he and she or he or she are the ones that will MC that process but it's about scheduling that into the process and making sure that you adhere to what Deb was talking about is the correct platform. Are we doing this live? Or are we doing it virtual? Are we doing it on Zoom? Uh, are we doing it on Teams? So on and so forth. So it's a, I, I just want to leave it with schedule it into the, the um, schedule. Make sure that we're scheduling for this and that we have repetitive um sessions so that we get better right so we're going to have a, a rehearsal and then we're going to recover from that and then we're going to rehearse again and again and again and i also like to have different types of individuals as part of the folks that are listening in on our our side uh, so that we get a depth and breadth of their knowledge and uh, they'll tell us hey that really worked gosh, have you thought about adding X, Y, and Z? And it's always that X, Y, and Z that wins it for us. And it's that total team collaboration and team sport. Great, Jennifer. thanks. And Rena, how, over to you. Uh, should you bring up cost or staffing levels during this presentation? Yeah, thank you. This is a question that we often get asked during our preparation. Uh, there's always an eager beaver who wants to start talking about staffing levels and say, well, but I could do it with fewer people. Time out, time out. <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, we say follow the government's lead. More often than not, I have never seen this and maybe it's just me, but government never brings up cost discussions during orals. Um, so if, you're, if you have someone on your team who's gonna start discussing staffing levels, basis of estimates, stick to what you proposed in your proposal. Please inform your team that this is not the right forum nor the time to start saying, yes, but we can do it with fewer people or well maybe i'm going to add a person two years down the line those discussions should not happen but if we have also seen where sometimes while the government is very scripted and they know what to ask they could go off script they may start you know pushing you or leading you into the cost staffing discussions you are uh, we we all we my advice would be to say that sounds like a costing discussion. May we get back to you in writing with that answer? We are not prepared to answer costing questions. Do not answer, don't start going into cost discussions during orals unless that was part of your oral requirement, which I have not seen my 28 years in orals. Okay. I have seen eager beavers start talking about it and we have to cut them off. <laughs> Great. And Andres, uh, what should I do during oral presentations to prepare for a potential protest if my company doesn't receive an award? Yeah, so this is a, a selfish question I'm going to tell you right now because it makes my job easier if I'm representing your company in a protest. Uh, you know, a lot of what protests come down to is the record, right? And so the agency, generally, they're the one who drives the record, but you can also contribute to it. So 
take copious notes. Make sure that you're you know, sort of documenting sort of everything that, that's going on, especially if, you know, as Rena mentioned, they start going off script. You, you want to, you know, certainly, you know, pay attention to that. And, you know, this is also for the purposes of, you know, identifying whether discussions are happening, because as I said before, that, that could be a protest point. Um, and, you know, sort of along those lines, one thing that's, that's really good to do is to sort of come into uh, the, the oral presentation with a sort of checklist of what uh, you need to cover at, per the solicitation. And, you know, check off that list to make sure that you've, you've uh, you know, covered everything. Because if you hand that to me for a process, then I get to say, well, look, they covered everything, right? And, uh, and then it'll, you know, obviously come down to competing, you know, records. But, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, how those, those things go. Um, and then, you know, if you can, um, see what you can find out about how other uh, uh, offerors' uh, oral presentations went. Now, most of the time, you're not going to hear much uh, about it, but every once in a while, you will. And obviously, you know, I'm, you know, you don't want to violate any security requirements or anything like that. But to the extent you can find out about how that went, that may help in a protest as well. So, for example, if discussions happen and they, uh, the agency asked uh, another offeror about some problem that they uh, saw with their their presentation or their proposal, and they didn't offer you the same opportunity, but then they dinged you in your your evaluation for it. Well, that's something that would help in, in a protest, right? So, uh, so finding out, you know, sort of, you know, what that process looked like for all the offerors is, is going to be key as well. Uh, but largely, it comes down to pay attention and uh, document as much as you can. Great, thank you. Okay, and we do have a flurry of uh, questions coming in, so I'm just going to read them in the order that they came in. Uh, we'll take as uh, as much time as we have left, and if any of the panelists are able to stay a little bit longer to help answer, that's great. Uh, first one is more of a housekeeping. Do we get a copy of this presentation? Yes, if you've paid for the webinar, you'll get the webinar, the PowerPoint, the recording. Uh, next question is directed for uh, Andres. Uh, if someone states a process or tool that might have been an error and we catch that in a debrief, is there a way to rectify that? Uh, here's a, as they, I'm just reading verbatim here, dumb example. Uh, we'll have the transition done in 30 days when in the technical response, we said 60 days. Sure, yeah, so uh, so th this is, kind of comes back a little bit to the uh, the discussions question. That's not a discussion question. That is more of a, uh, a limited exchange is, is the, the sort of term of art, but you can provide sort of clarifications and corrections of you know, clerical errors or misstatements during the oral presentation. Um, you, you can you know, kind of engage in, in that, that sort of back and forth. And you know, there's, there's nothing to, uh, prevent you from, you know, reaching out to the contracting officer or the evaluation team afterwards to say, you know, look, we, you know, we recall that we, we said, you know, this during the oral presentation, we want to, you know, make a correction, um, you know, as our you know, proposal says, it's really, you know, 60 days, right? So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's permissible. Great. Okay. And the next question is, if an oral presentation does not include Q&A or scenario, and is only the team presenting their response to the oral instructions, does FAR 15.102 still classify as an oral presentation? Uh, so for the most part, yes. Um, you know, really, uh, you know, as I said, the, the, the FAR is not, you know, super, uh, you know, clear about, you know, whether something qualifies as, as uh, oral presentation, but as long as you're having that sort of interactivity, that's, that's sort of, you know, live interaction, um, you know, that's, that's sort of, you know, where the, uh, the, the line is drawn, right? And so uh, in that sort of a circumstance where you don't have the, the situations or the, the Q&A, uh, it can still be an oral presentation as long as it's live because, you know, ultimately it comes down to does the government have the opportunity to ask you a question, right? If you're there and you're presenting to them, they do have that opportunity. And so there is that level of interactivity that would qualify as, as oral presentations under the FAR. Great. Uh, next question is, is the tech proposal still the overarching document or do we have a new obligation? That, I'm, the RFP will clarify that to say, you know, what, what is, and as Andres mentioned, right, and Andres, please step in here, um, orals are still part of your proposal. It is the overall proposal. Orals are not separate from your proposal. It is one of the volumes. Yeah. Whether in verbal or in slides. 
Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Um, ultimately, it's it's going to be a part of it, and and you know, as I mentioned before, the agency has an obligation to document it, and so it, in effect, that documentation of your oral presentation, it, you know, becomes part and parcel to your your proposal. Great. And then the next two comments are just from folks that I think are in similar roles as most of our panelists, talking about having good audio and internet connections. Uh, having a backup uh, laptop in case one fails, uh, and just compiling the uh, the presentation together. Um, so that does actually leave us a little bit of time. If anybody uh, has any last thoughts, and we can kind of start at the top. I think Deborah, you had kicked us off. So any um, anything that you felt you were not able to share that suddenly popped into your head in the last couple of minutes? Uh, the only thing. Sure. The only thing that I would add is, um, and it goes back to our roles as coaches, is we're also looking at the morale of the team. And we're looking at the team in terms of, I mean, the, the process, it's a grueling process. It's usually not a long period of time and they're working very hard. So part of our responsibility is also to communicate back to the capture manager, to the proposal manager, this team needs a day off. They're getting burnt out <laughs> or this needs i mean i've been known to bring music into a proposal room and make everybody stand up and dance because they were getting a little uptight and a little stiff so you know I, i'm looking at the whole team because how they convey as a team is so critical and i know this was mentioned uh before and it, we're very and, and troy said we're very protective of our team we want them we want to support them our goal is the win the goal is the win but as a coach, my passion is to support them, uh, to teach them skills that they can use for the rest of their life. I, I typically will say at the end of a proposal, I'm not going to collect the skills. You can keep them and you can only keep them if you use them. You use these skills, you use these presentation skills, these communication skills, you use them at work, you use them with your colleagues, but you also use them in your community, you use them with your family. Um, so this is a skill-based coaching that can stay with them for years to come. And that's really what, what my passion is. Thank you. And thank you so much, Jennifer. Really appreciate this opportunity to talk about what I love to talk about. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Deborah. And then Troy, I believe you had followed Deborah. So we'll bounce over to you for any last words of wisdom or pitfalls to avoid. Absolutely. Uh, I love what Deb just said, because uh, that's what I wanted to end with. Uh, there was a very wise philosopher who once said, if I give you a fish, you'll eat for a day. And evidently, they have just a, a light belly. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't. I, I would need more than one fish. But anyway, they said, if I give you a fish, you will eat for the day. If I teach you to fish, you'll eat for a lifetime. Right. So I apply that to the coaching process. If I teach you to present, you will present for a lifetime, uh, whether that is professionally or if it's with you your friends or whatever, the confidence that you will feel when you're speaking to them and the, the uh, tools that we've gone over and how we have uh, worked together to figure that out. And then I'm left with uh, two or three people in my lifetime that have held my hand with tears in their eyes. And they said, you've given me a gift and I don't know how to repay you. And I just simply say, you already did you're saying thank you. And that is ultimately what orals coaches can do is you take that fear out of them and you give them that ability to always feel confident if they're addressing any crowd and any person. So that's all I have. Back right. to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Troy. And Rena, over to you. Thank you. Uh, it's hard to follow Deb and Troy's very philosophical uh, uh, parting uh, words of wisdom, but I am going to pick up on one thing that they said and uh, and take it forward. Communication is the key to success. You know, I mean, we know it whether you communicate in your day jobs or communicate during one oral presentation, how you communicate is very important to get that message across. I am going to pick up on what Deb said earlier, balance. Remember, a proposal is still a sales piece, and so is your orals. Don't go in there, rattle off a bunch of things that, is, that are on your slides, and walk out. Your team should be comfortable enough in selling your company and your team. 
there is a balance in that there is a sales message. Don't oversell, but don't walk away with just technical, here I gave you what you asked me for and out the door. Sell your team, sell your skills, sell your capability. It is a sales pitch at the end of the day. So don't forget that. And with that, I'll move it, move it back to you, Jennifer. Super, thank you. And uh, last but not least, uh, Andres. Yeah, thanks. And you know, really, there's there's little I could do to uh, to sort of you know drive this this point uh, home even further. But you know, what you should you know certainly walk away from beyond the sort of best practices of you know how best to do this is to understand that there are resources out there for anybody who has uh, you know questions about how this looks and um, you know about um, you know what happens afterwards if things don't go well, right? So uh, this whole panel is is you know comprised of, of folks that this is what we do. This is, you know, kind of, uh, you know, how we've set our careers uh, to uh, to help guide you through this process. So uh, just understand that uh, that no offerors, you know, really alone uh, in this process. There's there's resources out there. And certainly, um, you know, if uh, if anything goes wrong during the process, if you don't get the award, you know, you can give me a call if you're you know preparing for uh, you know, these these things. You can give any one of my my co-panelists a call. Uh, there's there's resources out there, so uh, so you know don't think that you're on your own and that you know a, a confusing solicitation uh, is is you know you, you just have to you know kind of grind your way through it. There there's resources out there, so uh, hopefully we hear from some of you. Awesome. Thank you, you guys. This was uh, fantastic. I want to thank the audience for taking time out of their uh, day, beautiful day up here in the D.C. metro area. Um, the panelists put a lot of time and effort into this. Uh, we had prep calls and, and they worked well together. And as you can tell, um, great content. Um, they're all very knowledgeable. You've got their contact information here. Please reach out to them. They are your best resource. Um, and so if there are any questions that you did not um, have time to type in or something that uh, you just wanted to talk to any of these folks uh, offline, please call them, email them. Uh, we'll get the slides out to you probably today, tomorrow. The recording will take a little bit longer, probably by Monday. Um, but yeah, the panelists, you guys did a great job. I enjoyed this a lot. Uh, it was great to work with you all. You guys were easy to work with and, and fun to work with, um, which is great. So thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your Friday and have a great weekend. Um, I really do appreciate it. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you panelists. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, audience. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank Bye -bye. you.